you know, for me, a big part of what I love about the dream arc is there is this connection to mythology. And this is something that I think we're going to be exploring more like that relationship to it. It's like the myths of the lands where we're from. You know, I recently visited England, well, specifically the West Coast of Wales. And the, the stories of Merlin are rich in that part of the world, right? Merlin has been, is, is so deeply embodied in the mythology there. So when I'm there, it, it, it's like there's, it's like I'm in personal relationship with Merlin. I was just receiving so many synchronistic insights and things like that. And and then when I'm here, where Merlin isn't part of the myth of the land here, so it's there's not that same necessarily that same connection to it. There's other myths that emerge from the land here. The First Nations have very powerful myths about this. Even one of the first origin myths is about the lake that I live on here, Lake Cowichan, and so. You know, they have these myths that are very resonant. And for me, the the Grail Mysteries reconnected me to the myths of the world that I'm from. We are here for this episode with the amazing Matthew, who is in Canada at the moment, and we're in England, and I'm aware of a bit of an England connection from a couple of chats before which i'm excited to explore a bit more but we're going to obviously be talking a lot about the dream work and we're going to be having a lot of fun and a lot of sharing and so um yeah really i think matthew it'd be lovely just to hear from you a bit about your background and you want to care about care to share rather about you know background in studies or around work and obviously moving towards how you ended up being involved in the dream work would just be really great to start there yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That love of the dream arc that just keeps blossoming more and more every day. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's one of those things of being able, I think it was Steve Jobs that says, you know, when you look back, you can see all the dots that we're connecting to bring us to where we are today. And, you know, even simple things like ending up in breakout rooms with Kazia on DreamPod calls, you know, last year during the, the initial DreamPod launches. And so, my journey, yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the things that's interesting is I actually lived in the t- in the town or very close to where you guys live right now. So yeah, I grew up in England, and my life there was very different, and it was a big transformation coming to Canada. And I think where the dream arc ties into it all is it's really been about reconnection for me, reconnection to Gaia, to to the to the land, to the people, and to spirit. You know, all of that is encompassed within the work of the dream art. And, you know, when I was um, at university in England, I went to, I studied aerospace engineering at Bristol University in England. And so it was a very heady world. It was very intellectual. It was very, um, you know, focused on the material realms and without necessarily that same root and spirit. I was quite confused because I also was raised in a Catholic church. And so I was like, science, religion, science, religion. And then <laughs> moving to Canada, something there just seemed to open things up. I live on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, I lived in the Victoria, which is the capital of BC for a number of years. And I just found myself you know, gradually more and more being exposed to different traditions and and much of uh, my kind of process of opening up more and more to this kind of thing, to the relationship with the, with nature and the animals, which I felt very disconnected from in many ways because of being so up in the head. And so going along to some of the sacred sites in England, like Avebury and Stonehenge, Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland, these things brought me into a deeper connection with it all. And then, of course, the Gene Keys journey opened up. So I was working with the Gene Keys for about, I would say, um, 10 years before the Dream Arc opened up um, as a course. And the seed of the Dream Arc had been planted maybe five or six years ago, maybe longer ago, I can't remember now, but it was, we had this one piece of paper and it would connect different gene keys with different creatures and animals. And so I would start seeing that connection even back then. And then 
that I work within the team and for a long time I was doing transcribing. So things like this, I would end up transcribing this. A lot of Richard videos or a lot of um, Tanmayo videos, I would end up transcribing them. And I started to transcribe some of the ones for the Dream Art courses. It was coming together and I just felt this energy building up around it. And, you know, I just felt such a deep love of what was being created. And, and then, you know, as many people who kind of launch into the work of the dream arc, I, I think where it really opened up for me is about a month before the course was launched live to the, to the world, I was getting daily visitations from woodpeckers, these beautiful creatures that would just come. Sometimes it was, they were making it really obvious because I had a metal fence beside my old door and they would just bang on the metal fence. I think they forgot they were woodpeckers and not metal peckers. But yeah, they, um, you know, they, they just were there. And then the dream arc opened up and I got into it on the very first day. It was like, I cracked that thing open and got into it. And it was just the end of my woodpecker visitations. It was like, oh, okay. These were my portal creature, quite obviously. And they took me into deepening further my rhythm, my inner rhythm, and then my rhythm with all of life. And it has just been such an expansive journey through working with the dream arc. And I've become more and more in love with the journey each and every step of the way. And it is something that's drawn upon not only my personal experiences, but also the you know the different I've, I've tread trod shall we say different spiritual paths in my time and this seems to draw upon the wisdom of so many of them and i think the other piece too is just this blossoming of creativity inspiration and creativity that emerges out of this and so you know it was about a year and a half ago i just I was asking myself, I was literally asking, how can I be of service to the dream arc? That was the question that seemed to come alive in me. And so what I started doing was hosting clubhouse spaces. And I was already hosting clubhouse spaces, but I brought in elements of the dream arc every time. And so we would call upon a particular creature and that creature would work with our whole group. And so each week it would be working and just so much magic. And there was no attachment to anything from this. I simply, it was like one of my most joyful parts of the week was coming into this, this, you know, sometimes small, sometimes large gathering. And just over time doing that and the feeling that building that resonance. And then what do you know? Now I get to be a part of the team working directly with the dream arc with you guys and with Rosie and with Richard. And it's just, it just continues to, crack things open so when that woodpecker first showed up and said hey i'm taking you through a portal i didn't you know it's an initiation this this whole journey and it's like i don't know what's on the other side of it and every time we go through a portal like this it's i don't know what's on the other side of it but i do know that every time as challenging as it can be at times moving through through some of the growth curves and processes it has opened up to a world of such richness and you know there's just so much that i've heard from people within our community that are working with the dream art that that just it builds it builds my love of this and perhaps i'll get to share some of those stories that i've heard from others at some points today but just so meaningful and how far reaching this work with the dream art is uh, beyond what my mind initially conceived i think even beyond what rosie and richard you know, thought that it might be possible here. Like many creative things, right? It's like we create it and we, you know, we don't know how it's going to be interpreted or worked with and, and people build upon that. So that's, that's how my dream arc story kind of has unfolded to date. And I could go way more into some of the other things if they're, if they're of interest at times during this conversation, but I think that gives a good overview of the process <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's that's a beautifully told story Matthew I really love it because it had so many points on how is your personal journey within it but also how what is the dream arc like for all all of you listening and and watching this is like this is the magic that the dream arc 
is all about, as you mentioned. And I love that uh, through what you were saying, I could hear that, you know, there's always these signs and little, um, you know, pointers in life that always brings you into another and unfold another option for you and another and another opportunity. And as you said, like, I could feel that when you landed in DreamArk, like that's exactly where you were meant to be because, you know, straight away with that woodpecker coming and, and, and initiating you. And I totally am with you on that one because I had the similar initiation from praying mantis and I was hunting for fears for four months. So DreamArk is not just like, you know, uh, running in the meadows and singing with like butterflies. <laughs> it's actually sometimes quite a uh, full on, very in-depth work and always needed. It's not something that is like come to you randomly. It's just, as you said, it's like, it's the initiation, it's the ideas, it's the then connecting to other people. Like with us, as you mentioned, it wasn't even once that we were in the, um, in a, in a room, it was twice. So yeah. out of all the retreats to end up, to end up in the same room twice. I mean, there was already, already the thread of this connection that, hmm, then when I saw you, uh, as a part of the of the DreamArk team, which we are so uh, honored and happy to be also with Martin here, I was just like, of course, <laughs> we already yeah, just touched somewhere, uh, touch base somewhere. So yes, thank you for sharing. That was really, really amazing. And um, I love also what you said about the the being in England, being so much more in in the head, and then somehow having an impulse, um, I suppose, and then moving to Canada where you touched face with all the more mm -hmm. like embodied sort of you know um memories of the cultures of the like you know of that of that wisdom that is that as you said is actually available everywhere for us but sometimes we do need to move across of the globe <laughs> to, to to find the actually like a, a plug-in point for us specifically so it's amazing and i i kind of would love to uh, go to the theme of bear for some reason i when I was doing mm -hmm. real research about you and um, I came across this amazing story that I love about you and the bears and then connection with the bears as an animal to the stars because it was the uh, the great bear in the sky. And I just read it and it really touched me. That was such a lovely, lovely uh, story because as you mentioned, the creativity as well. And from that story, I remember reading that you also uh went into creating a, like a cartoon with your with your family member which is like for me again this is the magic of the dream arc it's just constantly gives us a little sign somewhere then if we choose to see it and take it we take it in and then it really help us open up that creativity in us then some other signs come in and it's just like one amazing um storytelling essentially uh, sort of part so yes if you Unless you want to add something as well. No, but no, no, I'd love to hear more about If you would like to share your somehow connection to the bear, then we would love to hear that. Yeah, it's interesting. The, um, I'm, I'm still uh, attuning to my relationship with bear and what that is truly for in the, the bigger picture because it has been very interesting. I would do, you know, about 20 years ago, I was just... I just had this awareness that I had a relationship with bear and I'd never seen one. You know, you live on Vancouver Island, everybody thinks you see a bear every day. Well, I, I didn't see bears for my first 20 years of living here, you know? And um, one of the things I would say is that um, where I've now moved to as a result, of, it seems to very correlated with beginning of the dream art. It's very much come up. But I, I remember being in this, this is again 20 years ago and speaking with somebody who's a, a First Nations shaman. And I, I shared my sense that there was a connection to bear. And he said, yes, and also eagle. And, and those are two that, you know, that they are quite, eagles are quite prominent. I see those around here a lot. And so it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I would start to see the odd bear. Because I used to live in the city. Then I moved out into the rural areas. Well, bears tend to be a little bit more there. When I began this dream arc journey, there was a huge shift. And the shift brought me to this new town called Lake Cowichan on Vancouver Island. And literally, as you move to the, as you go through the entrance to the town, there's these giant bear statues. This is what we're known for um, around the island. And 
And so I've had a number of bear visitors here. And it may just be one bear that is visiting often. I'm not sure. I haven't gotten tagged or anything like that. So I don't know. But it's brought me so many kind of offerings. My first encounter with it in an interesting way earlier this year was my dog gets up at 12 o'clock in the evening. So I just gone to bed and my dog's barking at the front door and she doesn't usually do that. So I'm like, okay, what's going on? And rather than open the door, I thought I'll just peel. conveniently got a curtain with a window. So I, your window with a curtain and I peeled the curtain back and from, you know, this far away from me, there was a bear looking up at me because it must have seen movement or something. And so we literally stared at each other for about 10 seconds. It felt like I was just receiving this this presence. You know, the pit of my belly also dropped because, you know, this is quite close proximity to a 400 pound bear that I don't know if it can open doors. <laughs> and so but one of the things that I later realized that that was exactly a year to the day that I started the dream mark, <laughs> a year to the day. Now I'm not promising that everyone's going to get that kind of visitor after a year <laughs> working with the dream mark, but it was interesting. And then the one you're speaking to there, Kazia, that was, yeah, that was very recent. And that was quite interesting in a number of ways, like you said. And so again, it began. This time at 4.30 in the morning with my dog barking at the door. And it's like, okay, there's a bear there. And I look out the window. <laughs> I look out the window and there's this bear. Um, sorry, I didn't see the bear. I saw the the sort of the gate that we have there into the floor. It was it was down. And so it's like, okay, something big knocked this oak. And I got the lights on on the porch and I look to the left and he's not there. I look to the right. I don't see him. I'm about to step out. And then I thought, no, let's just have a look. So I went to the very edge of my peripheral vision like this. And I look and he was sitting on my rocking chair on my porch. <laughs> I love and that. I don't know if he was sitting there because he was like trying to stay out of my way or whether he just kind of made himself comfortable there for a little bit. I have no idea. Don't yeah. tell me that he had a cup of tea because that was. Yeah, well, that, that would be kind of, yeah. I mean, those are the kinds of images that, and so. So I kind of knocked on the windows, like that was as brave as I got in that moment. I was going to open the door because again, he was about three feet away. Um, and she realized he couldn't get out the way he came in. So he leapt over the top of the, um, the porch and down and went away. And I was talking to my brother and my brother-in-laws the next day. And one of my brothers suggested, he said, Hey, you should, you know, make a, you should make a children's book out of this. There's a story in here somewhere. And I just thought, oh, yeah, this could be kind of fun. I said, well, he's, his name is Bruno. That's the, the name that the neighborhood has given him. We have Bruno and Yogi are the two ones that seem to be recognized. And so this was Bruno. And so the title quickly became Bruno the Rocking Chair Bear. And it then became this back and forth between me and my brother-in-law because he's got two young children. And one of the exercises, activities that is in the dream arc, and it's actually in our free journey, the Jaguar's journey as well, is this invitation to create a children's book and to read it to a young child. So I don't have any young children of my own. My dog doesn't quite receive them in the same way, but my brother-in-law and my sister, they have two beautiful kids. And so we basically tailored this story to them. And the other thing was that it was <clears throat> some of the impacts around bear recently that kind of stirred up my emotions. And, and, and so this is like it about it's playful, but there's also going into the depth and the pain of it is that recently more than usual, we've had three bears euthanized here. <clears throat> See, it even chokes me up a little bit. We've had three bears euthanized because people were leaving their garbage out and it attracts the bears. And so they get conditioned and they come back to certain places and homes. Um, unfortunately, some people were doing it deliberately because they don't want the bears here. So it's, and so it's kind of heartbreaking and there's community members coming, starting to come together to, to bring more bear awareness. And so that kind of what, where this children's book went is that, you know, we, me and my brother-in-law were writing this. And instead, what we switched it around was that 
humans were a problem and the bears and the raccoons were just trying to live in their homes. And so the bear educates the raccoon on how not to attract humans by leaving your garbage out. And so it just was playful. And within 40 minutes, I'm not saying that will ever be published. It might, I might go deeper with it. We might go deeper with it. Um, but it was just a simple creative burst. And then the other part that you mentioned was that we had a day when there was power was out for 25 hours. And so that gave me lots of time to just stare at the night sky. But I came out on my front deck and I look out and I see the star correlation and it hadn't occurred to me. I was like, is that the big dipper? It's shaped like the dipper. And I, I got out my phone because there's an app for that. Right. And so the Stellarium app showed me that this was Ursa Major and Ursa Major is known as the great bear. Mm -hmm. And, and so I was like, okay, well, I've got the bear showing up at my front door. And then this is right there in that. And it's aligned with the North direction too. So, I then have now begun playing, and I've been, you know, one of the things that has helped root me to my English roots more, if there's a myth that I could say has roots, it's the, the myth of Arthur, King Arthur, all right? And Arthur and the Great Bear constellation, and Merlin originally said that the comet, the, a comet that came out of that constellation towards Earth is where Arthur came from. And so that's where so much of this mythology was born. And so I'm, I'm finding my own correlations, but as is the nature of the dream arc and any kind of symbolism, you know, I, I can notice how quickly my mind might want to latch onto a particular symbolism, but I'm just allowing the symbols to take me on a journey. And so right now, Bear is definitely one of those creatures. It's taking me on a journey. It's opening me up in new ways. It might turn out that it's my kin animal. I haven't clicked there yet. I barely just made decisions about the guardian creatures, let alone the, you know the kin creatures in the future. Um, but there's a strong relationship there, and I live in a part of, in a community that it, it's almost like I'm being called to play a role with others in being the guardians of these bears in the simple ways, educating people so that. You know, we think of how leaving our garbage out might be convenient for us, but it could be the death of the bear, you know? So, so yeah, I, I, these creatures show up and they can show up in playful and interesting ways. And I've got other bear stories, but I think that's enough for now. And, and yet they can take us on to these profoundly deep kind of journeys and bear isn't done with me in that sense. I don't feel and uh, at the same time, there's other creatures that show up too. But it's it's quite interesting living somewhere where bears are your most regular visitor. So I don't have mice. I don't have rats. <laughs> you know, we've got cats dealing with those. But it's the bear. So, so I, yeah, that's my some of my bear stories. <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing. I'm asking you, and it's like obviously that very specific connection to the bear just shines through in terms of the that actual visitations and then this kind of creative journey you went on with the book and connecting with family members and the kids. And I guess back to that sort of joining of dots that you could never have imagined up front, right? And that, that really resonated. And I think also you, you mentioned about the, the Jaguar series and the invitation as part of it to make a children's book. And I know something for me that I have a difficulty with in general is not always feeling to create something so that it has a really specific outcome, but doing it for the enjoyment and for the love of the process. And when you sort of said, you know, whatever it might become and however it might touch people's lives is, is awesome. And it, why not? It could become a bestseller in the next year. But the, yeah. the way you went into that <clears throat> more just the process of the creativity is something that I've already taken away from our chat today so yeah thank you for sharing that as well I yeah. love oh, sorry. sorry go ahead i just i love also that it's um the bear visitation was initiated by actually your dog so there's another animal that is like you know yes. domesticated by uh, she she isn't it yeah i remember her yeah, she. <laughs> um she's um 
came to alert you, you know, she started barking. It's like, it's, it's, if you look at it all, it's such a beautiful connection. Like our domesticated animals help us to connect with the wild sort of part of, of the nature. Then we, I mean, I can only imagine the, the feeling when you stood like pretty much face to face with the bear, only the glass was like mm-hmm. between you. I mean, that must initiate also some memories from, from inside you know, your own experiences from the ancestral and, and, and your past lives and that sitting around the fire. I mean, we always um, invite you all to put like a little candle as we have here, excuse the noise, <laughs> but just because, you know, this this sort of um, connections are so like uh, making something um, alive in us from, from, the, from the meaningful connection to the earth, you know, so... That sort of initiation by a bear being so close to to his amazing energy, but yes, like also quite. What what am I supposed to do now? It's it's incredible. It's incredible, and the creativity that comes from it, and the mission, and the you know the purpose as well. Like it was beautiful, very very nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was it was. I just wanted to speak to points on both of both of you shared there because yes, the dog absolutely, Gracie. She that's. Gracie is named actually after one of the seven sacred seals, the seal of grace. And so she can also be disgraced, which is something we've learned along the way. So it depends what kind of mood she's in. But <laughs> that uh, that interaction with the bear, yes, where she plays that protector role. And it's interesting, actually, because I was in this retreat. We've been sort of attuning to our guardians recently. And so I'd worked with the Raven for the first year and that was easy. And then it was an easy connection. And now I've had to listen a little deeper, maybe because we're doing it as a collective, maybe because I, my new role in this world now, um, but I had to listen a little deeper. And, um, and then I, I made the choice when it wasn't like I was getting lots of synchronicities, like I wasn't getting synchronicities to help me make the choice, which is sometimes how it happens. But this time it was when I made the choice, then the synchronicities came. And so I ended up choosing the guardian and I discovered talking about family lineage, I discovered that the family crest for the ash gowns has a, a lion on it. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. And then there was other lion references. And then I realized I've literally got a statue of a guardian at my front porch. Didn't stop the bear getting in, but he's there. And so I went and snapped a picture of the guardian and Gracie does a photo bomb in the background with a big grin on her face. So as much as it is like there's the lion, there is a dog play. That, you know, she is the guardian of this home in many ways. Um, ironically, when I open the door to go and see what's outside, and she runs upstairs and is well, looking behind lion. me. Well, you know, she she knows something. She knows, too. yeah. What are you doing, you fool? <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> Yeah. And I imagine what you shared there too, you know, that's, that's something that's been a big life lesson for me about my creative process. Um, you know, I'm someone who's really wanted to make a difference in the world and, 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 re- and has come over time to realize that the simple things make a difference. Yeah. You know, when I was younger, it was like, it had to be big and bold. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes the, t- the little, little things. So these little acts of creativity that bring ripples in the field. And yeah, I, th- I think I, I would say I learned a lot from Elizabeth Gilbert around this, um, but also my own life journey was to have, you know, just the, the joy of the protest process, enjoying the process mm-hmm. rather than the attachment to the outcome. I remember the story of J.K. Rowling when she was writing Harry Potter, mm-hmm. you know, she only ever saw it. 12 people in her reading circles would read it. She didn't expect, didn't have that expectation of it. Yeah. Because I think that expectation of the difference it can make, like, mm-hmm. you know, or what message is going to, can take, can become that creative block to that creative flow. And so in that situation with my brother-in-law, it just simply was like the joy of that creative process. And just like meeting the creatures, it can begin with the joy of the creative process, but then you do get into those deep, dark places as well. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's, it's like you need the candy of the synchronicities to get us to look at it. And then when you're inside, it's like, okay, you had enough candy. Now it's like <laughs> outside. It's work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I love it because you said it like that loops back um, to what you said at the beginning about Rosie and Richard and all the people who created the dream arc. Um, you know, 
they don't they don't even know what an amazing ripple effect it has been created mm -hmm. and and to be fair it 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 comes from that example it's as you said for to anyone anyone who creates anything it's just it's an invitation just to really uh try to see that in simplicity there is such a great power in a way of like the world needs each of us, you know, to create because that little drop in the ocean, whether it's huge or tiny, it's still a drop that creates this amazing, amazing, like collective sort of, you know, change and, and vibe. So it's like, this is it. Like, you know, you create something and you don't know where it's going to end up and who's going to be inspired to do another action with it or just to change, change their hearts, you know, to connect deeper with that bear story, the bears, and, and just to try to save them, to live more consciously. That's mm -hmm. that's beautiful. So mm -hmm. that's from little story, as you said, to come to this even message. I mean, that's that's already huge, like, you know. So we've been yeah. on in a second to a bit of a dynamic, interactive part of the podcast. There was one other thing just to give you an opportunity, yeah, if it resonates and how much you want to share. I think you mentioned about the Holy Grail, didn't you? Mm. Is that something that you'd want to share on the podcast about your, your, is it on your Instagram? Did you find it? Yeah. That? Yeah. Yeah. It's, he had a Grail quest and that really intrigued me. I guess it's, it, it does combine with your, um, you know, with your, uh, the jinkies, the archetypes, the myths that you are very connected to. So yeah. I suppose, you know, um, I'm curious, we are curious, is that something you would like to share about or is that? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll try not to overshare because I can get carried away. But yeah. <laughs> absolutely. It's, um, you know, for me, a big part of what I love about the dream arc is there is this connection to mythology. And this is something that I think we're going to be exploring more in that relationship to it. It's like the myths of the lands where we're from. You know, I recently visited England, well, specifically the West Coast of Wales. And the, the stories of Merlin are rich in that part of the world, right? Merlin has been, is, is so deeply embodied in the mythology there. So when I'm there, it, it, it's like, there's, it's like I'm in personal relationship with Merlin. I was just receiving so many synchronistic insights and things like that. And, and then when I'm here where Merlin isn't part of the myth of the land here. So it's, there's not that same, necessarily that same connection to it. There's other myths that emerge from the land here. The First Nations have very powerful myths about this. Even one of their first origin myths is about the lake that I live on here, Lake Cowichan. And so, you know, they have these myths that are very resonant. And for me, the, the Grail Mysteries reconnected me to the myths of the world that I'm from. And, you know, I was born in Bristol, which is on the West Coast and, and of England. And that part of the world is considered to be Avalon. And so, you know, the Isle of Apples. And I've had this, so this deep resonance with that. And it was about, again, I would say about 15 years ago, I, I started having these dreams or in meditations, I would hear these names and words and I'm like, they weren't recognizable to me. But when I started, because... Google is very handy for piecing together dreams and meditations. It was all pointing to this Grail Mysteries. And Joseph Campbell speaks about the Grail Mysteries of being one of, it, it's like the great Western mystery. It's the foundation of so many of our mythologies. It, it's a myth that's really resonated deep. We still see movies, not always good movies, coming out related to King Arthur and those Knights of the Round Table. And this was actually one area where it's like, I felt really pulled that my creative writing would be around that. But I kept meeting that pressure that you were talking about, Martin. Like it's gotta be, it's gotta be another worldly message. It's gotta be, rather than just simply enjoying the process. But, you know, in the Gene Keys, there's, I think it's in one of the Gene Keys, the 13th Gene Key, where Richard's talking about the gift of discernment, the city of empathy, and it's, it's around exploring a myth that will take you home and so it kept pointing me back to this story this myth that will take you home and although it's set in you know ancient times the message any true myth is timeless and so the message of this is still relevant to me and others who are drawn to it in this time that we're in there's this quest for this holy cup this grail cup which again is a symbol 
you know, and over the years, I've I've seen the historians battle it out around the truth about Arthur and Merlin, and you know, people get very caught up in their ideas of it and who's right and wrong. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's the richness and depth of the symbolism, like you said, as you know, the archetypes, the meanings of that, and so this Grail mystery has been one that's been a real guiding light for me in that way and coming to understand the grail in its its many forms and its many symbols and you know because it's been it's been a chalice it, 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 it's been a, a spear it's been um a cauldron you know it's had different uh maybe not the spear but it's had, it, the cauldron it's been a gem that's fallen from the sky an emerald gem it's been a number of different things those symbols being relevant to the cultures they were part of in some way and the times that they were in as well. And so it continues to be something that, you know, I, I receive insights about or inspirations about, and it's just something that's very close to my own heart. And you'll find, I think that a lot of people within the Gene Keys community also feel a real resonance with it. They can recognize some of these archetypal figures. And so, you know, for me, where it connects into the dream arc as well is that the story of the Fisher King is about the healing of the wound of the Fisher King. Percival is one of the knights who, who's, who's on this quest and and he at first comes into like it. And I think this is so such a, a nice reminder. He first comes into it. He's like, I'm going to be a great knight. I'm going to be the best knight in the land. So I'm going to find the Holy Grail so I can be the best knight in the land. Well, he finds it, completely misses it. And so he drops the ball and he has to kind of go on this whole other journey again. But this time he comes around and and he's been taught the power of question, hence quest. And and this time around, his question is, how can, um, whom does the grail serve? Right? And that's the question, the grail question. Whom does the grail serve? And so he now comes to realize that this is for the healing of the wounded fisher kid. So the word of Fisher King rules over this wasteland. You know, again, contemporary times, we can consider the wastelands where we have the rulers that are ruling over and their their wounds and their um, traumas that are preventing them from being a source of fertility. And so the Fisher King is healed by the grail, and then the whole lands are healed in reflection of that. And I feel that's a part of the gift of the dream art, where there's this reconnection to the land there's that comes through there's such a, a rich feminine wisdom and the dream mark that is needed in these times the grail mysteries is one way the to the to the indigenous cultures they've experienced it in a different way and they've got their myths and their stories around it that resonate with their being and where they live in the land and so for me that's where the grail mystery ties in with the dream mark is this whole idea of the healing of the wastelands right and so these small everyday um things that we can do to regenerate one of my teachers says that that which does not regenerate is not the grail so a key component of the grail of knowing of the grail is it brings this regeneration not just to self but to all of life and so yeah, we could talk much more about the Grail Mysteries, but that for me in, in its essence and connection to the dream arc is really what speaks to my heart and lights me up for sure. Wow. Oh, boom. Incredible. That was cool. <laughs> I must say, I'm so happy I asked the question. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Thank you that was, it. <laughs> that was amazing wisdom that, yeah. you know, you just shared. I really, I mean, we could talk the whole episode, even few, just on I'll come back. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, For please sure. do. Let's just touch on that in, in another episode at some point because it's fascinating what you just shared. And yeah, and I, I felt that um, wisdom <clears throat> landing in me or almost like remembering, you know, in me that that's, I I'm, I really want also all of us to live in the, in the kingdom that is ruled fair and beautifully and probably on some different mm, ways, completely different than that. Uh, it's happening right now, but like that, that you know, sentiment, that feel is there. That it's possible that it happened before and it can happen still. So, thank you mm-hmm. for leaving us with this beautiful feel to to this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess it's so emphatic way that was 
individually we can all work on those traumas and when you say regenerate it's kind of rebirthed and reborn which is around the feminine and where we talked before about creativity and allowing things to pass through us whatever it is and not being beholden to the outcome it's it's just all of that isn't it it's just mm. everything we were chatting about before was very yeah articulated really symbolically through those myths and those metaphors and those symbols that you shared around the Charlie Graham so yes and Sonny's We've proper been... spinning around happily about that as yeah. well yeah yeah that was oh, yeah. Awesome. Oh, he's spinning around because I, I I think one of the things I didn't mention in there that I think is relevant is the idea of a round table. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. It was Arthur in the round table and the round table, the idea behind the round table was they all sat and they were all equals around this round mm -hmm. table. So yeah. though they were, you know, it was King Arthur and he played that role, but there was a mutual agreement of service, meaning Arthur was in true service, in humble service to the people, and the people were equally in humble service to him. Yeah. There wasn't there wasn't that same hierarchy. And so that round table is a is a kind of a beautiful symbolism. So I just want to thank you, Doc, for uh Oh, so we're gonna move on to the Oracle. I'm just gonna share the screen. And um this will move us nicely into having an animal to discuss um, and see what pops out after all this very rich conversation already. And also from after this, we can then move a little bit more into the dream work and what you've been up to in there through working on it as much as what you've been receiving uh, as part of the retreats as well um, and a bit of a look to the future. But yeah, we'll do the, the oracle first. Is there anything you want to say before... We click and we choose. I just would like to invite everyone who is listening, watching, like in this time and in time in the future, like on any timeline, basically, just tune in with us if you feel like it and try to imagine sort of what animal can come up for you as well and what story is connected uh, to that animal or you with that animal because I'm sure there'll be something to share for yourself and within your heart and with others. So yes, with this intention, if you can do the honors and click. Ready. We will just feel into what message we get from animal for us all. The cockroach. Uh, Interesting. <laughs> I am the cockroach. I wish to be your friend. Why am I who is so harmless so hated by your people. We cockroaches are exceptionally socially aware. We make collective decisions without argument. That resonates from what we just said before. And we do not overcompete and we maintain harmony. Yes. The cockroach. Wow. What's coming through for you, Murphy? Yeah, there's a few things here. I think one of the first things I love to share is that I, I think what's beautiful about these um, creatures and especially these fear keys, you know, we see a cockroach and, you know, cockroach isn't something that leaps to mind as like a creature that somebody wants to work with. Right. It's like, you know, if they show up in your apartment, it's like, ah, how quickly is an infestation coming through or that kind of thing. And, um, you know, so many of these fear keys that we have that are already these insect, insects that can kind of give the heebie-jeebies, heebie-jeebies, <laughs> not the bee -gees, they were good. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and they um, they take us on this journey. I mean, there's underworld creatures, and so cockroach is very much one of those where it's like I can you know, live in disgust with it and, and fear with it and that kind of thing. And and I look at cockroach, you know, when I think of sometimes when there's been wars in the world and people have looked to dehumanize another culture, they've referred to them as cockroaches. So they've got this, like, like that said, you know, like why have we become so hated? Mm -hmm. And, um, and so to, to embody this and, and this one, um, it, it, it's a fear key, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on what the fear is that the cockroach specifically speaks to. Do you have that? Um, 
and, and I know this one. Thank you very much. So yeah, one second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is about it's it's a pathway of humility, and it is it it's this like it said it's this collective harmony. So it's it's not the fear of being oh it's the fear of what other people think of us. It's the fear oh. of what other people think of us. Interesting. That's right. And so how we I literally. Yeah. The three, well, I'll remember them. I'll see you. Yeah. It starts to come back from time to time. <laughs> yeah, there's 192 of them, but occasionally, uh, you know, there's only 60, there's only 64 fear keys, thankfully. So I, I'm able to locate that one. But this one is, it's it's actually been fresh in my field of awareness today. So it, it's actually been what's unspoken. You know, it, it's like before coming on to this call, I was dealing with some of this inner turmoil in my belly. And it's been related to this. And so it gives me that pause for reflection. And not only can I reflect on stories and experiences of them now, but it's like, I can go deeper with this because it's actually part of my own calling out and my being, you know, vulnerable in, in these kinds of spaces to be able to share these challenges, because um, it is something that I've struggled with in my life is what other people think of me. The fact that I'm even doing the dream art means that I've moved beyond that. Playing the role, having this conversation with you now means I've moved beyond that to some extent. And it can still it can still pop up, like in, in how we work the dream art, how we coordinate the dream art, how we bring the dream art to the world, you know. And so that's how I can relate to it on a, on a personal level in this moment with it. And I, I continue to go deeper. And so to know the cockroach is like, wow, yeah, look at the projections the cockroach has taken on. Like that gives me a sense of admiration for this in a way. Mm -hmm. I think one of the funniest stories or best stories that I heard, it wasn't like my own personal experience with cockroach. I haven't had a personal experience in this dream realm with, with cockroach. I don't think I've had other dreams of it either. Um, but somebody who's in the dream art community was sharing in a clubhouse space that she woke up in the middle of the night and I can't I, a cockroach was in close proximity to her. I can't remember if it was on her body in some way and that's what woke her up. And she said normally in the past what she would do is like oh my god get up scream and go <laughs> and get the kids in and get the kids to take it out and then she'd have to go and call the people to deal with the infestation she might have to do that anyway i'm not sure but she was aware enough in that moment for whatever time of the middle of the night this was instead of panicking she did what we just did she went to the dream art codex Mm -hmm. And she looked at the message. So rather than giving all her attention to the creature and what it was eliciting for her, she acknowledged the emotions, the feelings, the fears, that kind of thing. But it actually took her on a journey of exploration. And it actually, ironically enough, brought her to my website, my Grail Quest website, where she found a meditation and that helped her in the middle of the night. And it 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 was about the you know, the embracing of our higher self in a sense and so you know that's something if we are going to be our authentic self in the world then we are going to to meet and transmute with awareness that fear of what other people think of us mm -hmm. and you know being able to be fearless in that and so like cockroach i say thank you for taking on those projections but now the dream arc is saying we'll take that back from you mm -hmm. so you can live in your you know, you are one of God's creations, just like each and every one of us here. Somebody thought, some higher entity than me, Matthew, thought that, or some higher awareness thought that cockroach is a good idea. So I'm going to trust that. And I'm also going to recognize how, yeah, what a leap it can, um, you know, help. And I think it, is it in the leapers category? I don't, you don't need to bring that up again. Yeah. We have these <laughs> categories within the dream arc. And, um, Again, I don't remember necessarily which category each of them are in, but that kind of gives me a leap sense as well. Like, uh, yeah, well, that idea. oracle never fails to amaze, does it? That every every episode, it's such a we keep talking about synchronicities and don't yeah joining dots, but yeah, that touched upon so much of what we said, didn't it? It's such a it's a, a beautiful thing, the oracle, because it's like combines the fun of like that child childlike you know excitement of what's gonna come 
with like a extremely deep meanings, you know? So what you just shared, Matthew, I loved it. Like, thank you so much because it's like, and well done for remembering, like the fear of what people think about us. I mean, that is so deep in all of us or most yeah. of us. I'm trying not to project on, but yeah. most of us, let's say, it's actually came very close with this fear one way or another. And, you know, for you to share so vulnerably as well that, you know, before you came here and same with us, like we had the same. I was just like, am I going to sound good? Am I going to know what Matthew will share? And it's just like the fear <laughs> is so deep in us. And yeah. each time we do something like that, when we actually say yes, and we we are bravely show ourselves to the world and especially within communities such as Dreamark and, and Jinkies because it's such a loving and understanding community. And I'm hoping that because we do what we do all, like as you said at one point, the question like how can I be of service to the to the world? And every one of us got something to offer and something to to share, to to add on to the to the world. I feel like we can all go into this space of, you know, where where we can overcome that fear of what people think of us and actually see the beauty and, you know, of like, yes, whatever you're sharing, it's amazing and it's got a meaning and somebody somewhere might really need to hear it at that point, which, you know, what you share about the cockroach and I love how you said that, let's take the projections back so the cockroach can also enjoy this this planet and also they are so amazingly strong that they are about the only one who can survive if there was any oh uh, yeah so i mean this is they're pretty epic they're resilient, right? they're resilient. If, they, if they can survive what humans think of them <laughs> you know exactly. yeah. i mean cockroaches that... aren't hiding they're, they're not like oh god those humans really hate us don't they yeah, they're yeah. like, like come on guys let's take over this house you know i'm, I'm actually <laughs> sensing another story for kids so and adults obviously like about cockroaches who feeling the the heaviness of the projections in a somehow fun way obviously but yeah. Yeah, it's probably gonna. Yeah, happen. yeah, exactly. And 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 having fun with it, and I think that's that's what these creatures do. Even the scary creatures. You yep. know, yeah, it's, it's been amazing hearing how they've caused flips for people, and you know, like any one of those underworld creatures, there's things that we think about them. You know, and so those things that we think about them can be the very, you know, um, compass for our own awareness in that sense as well Absolutely. and very yeah. often initiations you know like i um have a personal story with a tick and tick is another very very feared uh insect you know because it mm -hmm. can create a lyme disease and i actually right. struggled with um that for for a big part of my life you know and i was initiated uh, so sometimes the the insect can initiate mm -hmm. you in a way and and at the beginning you might think this is the worst thing that can happen to me and towards the end, yeah. when you go through the cycle and you go on the other side through that initiation, you, I, I see the the whole purpose of it, and and I'm thankful to the tick for it mm -hmm. because I know that I am where I'm meant to be, partly thanks to that initiation as well. Even though it was really hard at times and you know not fun very often, but on the other mm -hmm. side, it's like wow, you know, it was like, so yes, the insect especially can actually bring a lot of interesting um interesting insight yeah. yeah it's going to be interesting over the years with the dream art as people come together in their clan animals you know so like richard is part of the toad plan that's something he's very aware of for himself right and um as people become more aware of it'd be interesting to see how many people consider themselves part of the tick clan or the cockroach <laughs> clan right it doesn't i, I i'm not certain that it's gonna have quite as many um you know, so those people will play an important role in our, you know, in the equilibrium within society, that, that collective harmony yeah. that the cockroach exactly. talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's sort of nicely uh, also connected to what we just talked about, about the round table. Yeah, as I say, the round table. And you want yeah. to talk about it. Well, yeah, that's what came up straight when I read it out, was that, yeah, the kind yeah. of with the round table being about that harmony yeah. and yeah, not, not judging others and all that good stuff, so... Yeah, well, yeah, right, right on point. So, um, yeah, so we're we're getting near the end, but no reason to be sad because we're we're not done just yet. Um, I think it was just an opportunity for you to share a bit more about your involvement with the Dream Arc and kind of generally a bit about the future and what you're excited. So, take that kind of where you want, and then 
after that there's one more part before we'll we'll, we'll round up the the episode um i guess the one word jumps to mind when we're talking about your involvement was squire and i know that <laughs> Asher and i are really intrigued for you to share with everyone a bit more about the word squire and where that comes into play yeah that's so it's it's interesting on a few different levels actually and and it does have its connection to the the the, the grail stories as well the grail stories is full of those squires and for anyone who doesn't know squires were basically those in service to the knight they would make sure that the knight's horses were taken care of or that they were prepared for the horse you know for being ridden that kind of thing so the squire was in service to the to the knight in that way and so it, you know, for me, approaching this work of the dream arc, it, it becomes very humbling because I was very much used, I was a solopreneur for many years. And and so there was kind of a, a letting go of an identity and to, to step into a role as squire is is quite, you know, it's, it's reminding me again and again that I'm here to be of service. Mm-hmm. And the, that that is what it keeps coming back to for me and that I get to play that role. I'm not just in service to Rosie and Richard and that it's the whole transmission. It's the dream arc. It's to each and every person that shows up. And so it, it, it again comes back to that round table piece. It's like, there's nobody above and there's nobody below. It's like this, this collective harmony will come about through that. And it was interesting when we began the dream arc retreat initiation retreat a few months ago, um, my wife had been away traveling and I had gone to pick her up. And this is the night of the initiation retreat opened up. And it's I was driving along a dark road and I could see the, the road ahead of me and I could see in the mirror behind me. There was no car lights coming towards me. I was just me on this open road. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, <clears throat> a, um, a raccoon ran across the road in front of me. And unfortunately, I hit it. And so my initiation into the dream arc was the first time that I've ever hit a creature. And we have, we've heard a lot about the deaths of animals and things like that. And, and the raccoon is actually related to equilibrium and harmony and balance. And so it felt like that was part of this entering into this. And so I met my wife at the airport. I picked her up and I had the dog with me and we were waiting outside because she's just, you can't take her inside. And when I told my wife about the story about the raccoon, I I realized the bench that I'd been sitting on was dedicated to somebody called Doug Squire. And I thought, isn't this perfect? Here I am. So I, I also looked up the meaning of Doug and it means entering a dark river. So it gave me the sense of the responsibility as well of entering into this is like this, the dream arc is a stream. It's a transmission, like so much of the other, you know, and that it will be, there's the journeys into the underworld and there's the journeys into the upper world and there's the journeys through the middle world. And it just, it's, it's the perfect name. And it, it came out of um, spontaneously out of Elijah's mouth. He didn't know of my connection with the dream, uh, the, the grail quests and things like that. Mm-hmm. It just emerged. And so I I received it and I, and I allow it to be that reminder because, and again, that connects into our friend, the cockroach, because the cockroach thread is the trio is the, the cockroach and the lamb and the blackbird and the blackbird is offering us a vision of humility. And so bringing that into any role that we play it's it's very cool to be the squire and get to do the things that i get to do and have these kinds of conversations and things like that and yet in that name is just that remembrance of why i'm in this role and yeah so i really like it that way awesome yeah i yeah I'm, i'm just like you know this whole conversation has been like so rich. So, you know, this is like, I think perfect sort of wrap up, wrap up point because, you know, this is coming back. I feel what you just shared is coming back to the sentence that I really like stood out for me from the very beginning about the service, you know, mm-hmm. to the, to the whole, to the world. And this role, as you said, is just through this initiation and through that quite dramatic, you know, point with a raccoon, you know, and, and. It's like brings it that sometimes universe and the divine brings us something quite 
from an interesting angle. And then we, it's up to us where we decide whether we take it or not. And it's so amazing that you took this 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 um, role because you know it's amazing that you're there and with us and in the Dreamark and we can all co-create this space in a, in a wonderful way to service to the world. So thank you for sharing that story and for taking this role and saying yes. <laughs> Anything else you would like to add? For me? Well, the main thing is that the toolkit, but also yes. if Mafia has anything else to share on the dream work in a general way is that, you know, mm -hmm. you may feel that we've, we've covered everything, but yeah, just an opportunity really, if there's something you want, people listening and watching to, you know, to know about the dream art, but kind of from your future, what this can, what this is becoming in this very yeah. collaborative way. Collaborative is the word that's, I mean, it, it, the very foundation of it is based upon collaboration. And here we are in this field with the podcast and all these other different collaborations that, you know, Rosie and Richard are very adamant. This isn't about them and what they're doing they're a big part of it. it wouldn't be here without them and we honor that and they honor that and and yet we have these wisdom keepers from around the world we have these contributors we have these great podcast hosts we have these all these different sources that are um, part of this and so moving forward we're really loving seeing how the dream arc is being integrated into teams and the, the story is only just beginning to unfold. Yeah. Like we have the Universal Love Alliance in Uganda headed um, by Samson Turinawe and Rosie's involved in that and Rosie's sister and many others are involved in that. And it's just one example of where the dream arc is having an impact. And, um, you know, in the subtle ways in which it shows up, it, it's, it's like we're being dreamt by the dream arc. There's this, you know, we could, we we can feel we are the dreamers, but who's really dreaming who? Mm -hmm. And so the dream arc also is a dream within a dream. So there's so much that is yet to unfold, and there's many things that people have been asking us about. I think the, the one thing I would speak to, of course, is the the article itself in physical manifestation, probably our most deeply requested, and so just knowing that that has been worked on and it's getting closer and closer to the time when we can release it to the world. And so we love this. We love the, I have a saying, you know, as we saw here today, the beauty of the article pull on it's, it's trust the algorithm when it comes to using it online, trust the algorithm because it really is divine. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, having a copy, a physical copy in our hands is I know something people really deeply yearn for and We've just had so much fun as a team co-creating that and the creativity that's poured into that and what is emerging from that. So the dream arc is a, a continual unraveling and and some of it we don't know, but some of it we've got a glimpse of and we are sort of bringing forward. And so we've had our one dream arc initiation retreat at this time, and we are going to continue to have other retreats, online retreats that bring people offline of course but um yeah very much looking forward to you know, the expansion of this work it's only just beginning it's like the you know in, for those who know the gene keys it's like the gene keys came first and then the dream arc seems to be this this fledgling bird that's kind of taking a leap out of the nest and and that's where it is and we're yourself myself rosie we're stewarding it out into the world and just listening to where it wants to go and, and how it wants to be expressed. But just seeing pockets of this appearing in different parts of the world just lights me up, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, the gift of anticipation feels alive in what mm -hmm. the dream arc can bring and also quiet detachment because as we've talked about before, it's like I'm, I'm hearing the stories of the impact that this is happening. Samson Turinawe who is associated with the Universal Love Alliance, he works with the Dream Arc and Gene Keys in counseling. And he works in situations where women and children are in very kind of abusive and patriarchal homes. And he shared one story about how he brought the Dream Arc to one particular family, whether it's through a group session or what, I'm not sure. But the, the father in the family who'd been abusive and, you know, at least verbally or emotionally, from what I understand, I don't know about physically, he'd ended up having a dream visitation from his family's clan animal. 
and the animal said how upset it was with him and how he needed to learn humility and that he needs to be generous and kind to his family otherwise they would get sick from the work from how he was approaching them wow. and so this shifted his whole attitude so it wasn't something samson directly said to him other than work with your own guy but this family this guy you know ugandas had deep roots in this wisdom and this is in a way it's spiritually liberating them that's how samson speaks of it you know i was always hesitant like what are we bringing to an art you know a country where they've got such a rich knowledge of this already and samson said it beautifully it's like it's it's giving them permission it's it you know there's still the religious conditioning that runs deep there that doesn't allow them to connect to their innate spirituality and so although it's still coming from another part of the world the western world it's it's liberating them in a sense because they're acknowledging that their own traditions are being accepted further afield now and so this was an insight this was a change that occurred for this person through the dream through a creature coming to a dream and that to me just like you know not to put too much pressure and expectation on it yeah at the same time is like who knows what is possible mm-hmm. you know peace on earth let's you know <laughs> the animals may help us more with that than we realize the holy grail yeah that's exactly. lovely that's a wonderful story thank you for sharing that it's like you're bringing the essence of this, like remembering, you know, it's like remembering. It's also just allowing people to remember what we all carry in us anyway, in our DNA and our ancestor history that is all in us. So that's, that's so, so beautiful that to, to feel that it's actually happening in our world is possible. It's not some sort of only magical, unapproachable uh, thing. It's actually as we, I, and I hope all of you listening, watching, like, also relate to it how it can be so close to us like your amazing stories about the bear and raccoon and now this wonderful story of like actually troubled family who who reached through the dream some sort of help of like it's 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 amazing it's wonderful very magical as the whole dream arc is so there's that word again magical magic it is absolute magic and Speaking of magic, we would love to ask you probably, Matthew, one last thing for you to share your magic or your, um, we're we're gathering like a toolbox of, uh, with our Mm -hmm. guests, each of guests is asked by us to, at the very end, to share a piece of their wisdom or some sort of practice that they've had forever or just since recently, that that is, is something that is really, really balancing you and makes you remember and yes that remembrance of like what's important where you're where you're balancing yourself some sort of tool that you use if you if you could that would be amazing if you could share with us yeah yeah the the first thing i want to share this one very briefly because i think it's just so everybody can return to it is the simplicity of our breath it's run through you know yogic traditions there's many different breathing techniques i think we can find those that work for us but some way to center ourselves to reconnect with our essence through through breath and yet the part that i really would feel called to speak to in this moment is the ritual piece that runs throughout the dream arc and that we we invite people to to begin ritual and, and, you know, for me growing up, ritual was such a big word. It encompassed so much. And then going to church every weekend and seeing these rituals played out, some of which felt like they'd lost their initial kind of spiritual intention. They just kind of become habitual rather than ritual. Mm-hmm. And, and I, you know, I think of that in my everyday life too, just remembering the simple gratitude for the food that I eat, my simple reverence for the creatures around me to bring simple ritual into each and every moment so that it offers a way for spirit to enter into the moment Um, because I can fall into habits. Like I can eat without presence or mindfulness or awareness, or I can eat with, you know, presence, mindfulness and gratitude, which is, you know, a simple ritual. And, and I think one of the things we create in the stream arc are these ritual spaces, the space where we go, where our intention, we bring our intentions into it and this supports us. And it's, it's, 
Um, we've underestimated in the world, or we've forgotten the value of these liminal spaces that cultivate room and space for transformation in our lives. And so for me to have those simple rituals at the beginning of my day and at the end of my day in these spaces have been really important, as well as the simple things throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, ritual, again, is something that we have so many different traditions and different rituals, and we might interpret it in different ways, but it can be like you've got the candle lit, you know, the ritual of lighting a candle when you do the podcast. I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or the simple rituals of writing our intentions and burning them and letting them go. And so those are things that, you know, the breath is, it, it is really been important part of that. And I don't know if I'm getting a two for one here, but it just felt, I felt a real call to mention ritual in there as well. I feel like that's one of the important things that the, the dream arc returns us to. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be complex, it can be simple. And it's just that honoring and how do we call in our ancestors? How do we honor our ancestors? Yeah, yeah I really like that I, in the way that we all, uh, we've all understood more and more mindfulness and the importance, even the scientific. And as you said earlier, to a degree, the heady side, the sort of logical side of mindfulness. But ritual is such a more richly textured version of mindfulness. I think they're very mm -hmm. similar, but it's got a nice flavor to that word ritual. And, and yeah. it can be applied by people in many different ways as well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I love that you shared that, uh, Matty, because um, we've just passed, um, it, which I know is in a, quite a lot of the world, parts of the world, um, people celebrate, well, celebrate actually, they remember the ancestors right now. Like I'm, I'm from Poland, so in Polish tradition, we uh, light a candle. Actually, in fact, we go to the cemeteries and we light a candle for for our ones that obviously you know passed on. And it's um, part of it. If lost, it's sort of as what you said. The sort of it became sort of like the habit when people go and have a mass, and then it's like a little bit sort of rigid. But the part when you go on the on the cemetery, and it doesn't even have to be cemetery. I, I I'm here in UK, so I couldn't be there with my family. So I just light a lit a candle, and I thank my ancestors on on all of them for you know I, I made like a little prayer, very simple. So I love what you invite us to 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 make it simple, but quite ritualistic. And sometimes those old ways can invite us to do things, but then we can do them our own way as well, just to like feel more connected and just to stop and, and yes, and, and make a little ritual of some form. So yeah, that, that's- You just given me something there because um, I've been really feeling, because I haven't been liking candles as often recently, and I've just been really feeling the last few days to really the strong call to light candles. And, and until this conversation, it's like, Oh, okay. Because my grandfather is Polish, and I didn't know this tradition. So you have just reconnected me to this is the power of this work for me. It's like it's it's reconnecting us to these traditions, and and I and because my grandfather's passed on, and so of his relatives, I don't have that strong connection on the earth plane to to Polish tradition that has been passed down. Definitely the English tradition. So. You, you know, now, now it's like, now I've got even more, now I know why I've been holding off on the candles and now I'm ready even more so because that's, that's, I'm going to have a candle for each of those ancestors that I'm bringing into that space. So That's wonderful. That gives me goosebumps. You see, this is again, the magic of dream work. I feel like we could talk forever, but I feel we can yeah, only yeah. stop here. <laughs> But basically, we just want to really, really thank you, Matthew, for, for being here with us. It's been so mm -hmm. amazing and beautiful space. And the stories were wonderful. You have such a storytelling um, talent. And I'm uh, looking forward to seeing more stories, the children's stories or whatever stories you'll come <laughs> up with, because it's, it's beautiful. The storytelling from you is beautiful. Yeah, like, well, thank, thank you. you for your storytelling, Matthew, and all your enthusiasm around the dream work and the animals and the nature and... The symbols and the mythology is fascinating and I feel quite cool to go and watch a film or a TV show about yeah, King too. Arthur as well. So thank you for that personal inspiration. To... Yes, you'll be discerning which ones you choose, that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank you.